I caught it on camera for you. <laughs> We're ready. You ready? Are you recording, Jin Pao? Yes. <laughs> nice. It's cold. Oh yeah, another one. Like home water. Does it feel like I belong? Trying to keep it alive. All this on your side. For a better confirmation. Yeah, I'm heading for the station. I can feel the dream. Now you try. If you're willing to just come along with me. Hi, I am Brandon Pierce and I am a student at Westminster High School in Westminster, Colorado. And I'm Dakota Hall. We are both students in the Aerospace Engineering program here. And this year we had the most amazing opportunity to work with NASA on a year-long industry-sponsored project. In July of 2022, we attended the NASA Impact Science Team meeting in Boulder, Colorado. There we learned about the impact study from the heads of the project, Vidal Salazar and Lynn McMurdy. We also had the chance to talk with a number of college students. That zero C on the third, fourth, and fifth, and can see how long it's taking that uh, front to propagate and pass through the earth. Scientists and engineers who were working on the projects for their study. Applying this to a winter storm, I wanted, I wanted a visualization that really kind of spoon-fed the data out to me. And we even had the chance to interview one of the former ER2 high-altitude plane pilots. It's the most difficult airplane in the world to fly. We listened and observed as they presented their findings on various topics. The science discussed was incredibly detailed and high level, but we did our best to try and understand what they were talking about. The second panel shows you the Doppler velocity and it folded over once. I estimated that it was about 10 meters per second or more. We spoke to several college students who were presenting their projects to better understand how we could one day make our own path to join NASA. And where it does that, uh, we actually see the smallest and most dense particles in a microcavity. The opposite of what we expect. All in all, this meeting helped set the tone for the overall project we were embarking on. We learned about the high altitude ER2 and the P3 Orion that would fly in tandem pattern to collect data. What we didn't know was that one of us was going to get the chance to fly on the P3 alongside the NASA crew and scientists. That would turn into an opportunity we would never forget. I'm Lynn McMurdy from the University of Washington and I'm what's called a principal investigator for the project called Investigation of Microphysics and Precipitation of Atlantic Coast Threatening Snowstorms. As a principal investigator, I oversee the entire project. So I have a, a large team of scientists that work with me from universities and also from NASA Goddard and other NASA institutions. And uh, we do everything for this project. We are designing uh, how to do the observations or observational strategy, how to analyze the data, how to uh, make new scientific breakthroughs with the data. I also was very involved in the planning long before the project came along. So I almost do everything, but I let other people do all the nitty gritty and I get to see kind of stand back and, 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 and let the great team that I have do all the real hard work uh, of, of the project. So the project is IMPACTS. Um, I'm the scientific project manager for this campaign. So IMPACTS is a campaign that is managed by NASA. Um, and we're trying to understand the microphysics of precipitation, specifically snow, the snow type precipitation. So um, IMPACTS, you know, is a multi-agency, multi-facility uh, campaign. We are deploying all the way from, you know, people from all over the United States, and we have some international collaboration as well. But we have universities throughout the United States participating in this campaign. Um, you know, they, they bring their expertise to the campaign, they bring their instruments, they work, uh, they bring their students, they work with us to collect measurements of uh, snow-related events. My name is Aaron Pina. I am a, an associate program scientist at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. I help in the uh, running of NASA Earth Science programs. 
especially related to weather. If we think about uh, some of these measurements that are required from the planes, we think about, so on the wingtip, we call wing, they're called wingtip probes. The probe is what's used to measure cloud droplets. Um, so if we think about the size distribution of which that the CDP, the cloud droplet probe, occupies, um, that range is something like 2 to 50 micrometers. Mechanical pencils are um, either 0.5 or 0.7 millimeters in diameter. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the, uh, the lead in that diameter. That 0.7 millimeters is 700 micrometers. So 700 microns. And if you think about something like the cloud droplet probe measuring two to 50 micrometers, you could fit um, something like 10 to 15 of those little droplets that we're trying to measure across the diameter of the thread that comes out of this, this mechanical pencil. Hello, Jen. Is it possible for you to tell us what you do in this campaign? In this campaign, I am coordinating the airplanes, trying to get them flying over the same stretch of real estate, looking at the same snowflake that's falling um, in the storm. And we've learned that you were a former pilot for the ER-2 plane. Can you give us a little insight of what that experience was like? It's a very challenging airplane to fly. The airplane book Jane's, which is a reference for airplanes, uh, describes it as the most difficult airplane in the world to fly. There's only one pilot. It's a single engine airplane, and it flies very high, roughly in the neighborhood of 65,000 feet above the earth. So you're quite high, you can see a long ways. It requires precision flying. It's a challenge. Why were you interested at first? Obviously, since NASA is the big like astronautical stuff, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. why would you bring this to NASA in the first place? Well, NASA, it's interesting. Not only do they go out in space, but they're also interested in studying how the Earth, the globe, you know, where we live works. And uh, they have a lot of satellites up in space. And uh, one, one series of satellites uh, measures precipitation from space. It's very hard to do especially uh, snowing or frozen precipitation. That's actually, the physics of it is really difficult. So they need to know, uh, we need to have uh, ground measurements and in the air measurements of, of snowfall. And we need to be able to relate that to our remote sensing instrumentation. So our observational strategy is to have a high flying aircraft that has instruments just like what's on the satellite. And then in, underneath it is another aircraft that has in situ, they're measuring actually the parts of the clouds and uh, what's called microphysics. That's what those little yeah. tiny parts, we can't see them with our eyes or we, they, we can see them a little bit, like when they get big enough to fall on your sleeve as dendrites and such, those are little particles that, are in the, that were originally in the cloud. So we need to relate those two together. With aircraft, we can tell it where to go and we go over and over again, so we get a lot of variety of measurements. So NASA is interested in being able to improve their measurements from space. And um, I'm interested in storms. I love storms. I love any kind of storms, and I especially love them when they're raining or snowing or anything fun like that. So that's why I'm involved. What is the purpose of impacts, and why is NASA so involved in weather when we've seen them be so involved in like space? Space, yes. I mean, um, um, NASA is known for space research. You know, we we have uh, astronauts. Uh, uh, trips to Mars, but very few people know that NASA has a lot of uh, investing on Earth research because, you know, Earth is where we live, right? Why NASA cares about the weather? Because the weather affects you and affects me and affects, you know, everybody that lives in the world, not just the United States. NASA is interested in understanding better the weather patterns that affect, that are affecting us. IMPACT is a very specific campaign because we're trying to understand how much snow falls in the ground. Right now, you see in the Weather Channel, for example, you see forecasting like it's gonna fall three inches of snow here, or it's gonna fall just uh, you know traces of snow. So the difference between traces and you know a few inches of snow um, has very important economic potential, right? So you might not be able to go to work because there's a lot of snow on the ground, but. You know, you could have planned better for your day if you knew the forecast was accurate. So what we're trying to do with impacts is improve the way that we're forecasting the snow. 
to improve, you know, econ economical improvements, like, you know, you can plan for it better, logistics, people, um, you know, that are moving people across the United States, aviation safety. I mean, there's the, the outreach of this campaign is, is very, very broad. Kind of areas up there that are uh, that are lakes is what they are. We are going to use a plane and putting our uh, projects on the plane. This is an RB12. Okay, it's a experimental life support aircraft. Okay, that's the title of it. It is built by students. Um, if you look in the cockpit there, what you won't see is round dials like we see in the movies. You see round dials, airspeed, altimeter. You know, all sorts of different things, all computer screens. This is a two passenger. It only has holds 20 gallons of fuel, but I only burned about three gallons per hour. We're going to fly our projects on a plane. He's going to pick a few to go on the outside of the plane. Ferguson, are we ready for take two? I'm ready, and I'm going to fly this time. Yeah. <laughs> all right, thumbs up, ready to go. We're testing his equipment. Go. You know, you get in a car, you just. Turn ignition on, bridge safe belt on, drive away. Right. But well, we do three major checks. Okay. External pre-fly, which I've already done before my first flight. Right. And we do the engine start, and then we taxi over there to do the engine run. Okay. So there's really three checks we'll do every single time we fly. All right, grab your headset there. Okay. Good check. And put it on. Right, so the passenger brief is that we need to get out, unhook yourself, make sure you take your headset off. You go that way, and I go that way. You don't go that way because the prop could still be spinning. Sounds good. The fire bottle between us, we need it. If I raise my hand, that means I've got to make a radio call. SS 394, Sierra Papa, Centennial Ground, fast banded Challenger on Alpha. Correct, follow Challenger on Alpha. All right, we'll turn the master switch on. Yeah. See ya. Come on, back. All right, we'll get it down. Ready? Yep. Come on. Back. Uh, we'll get a fuel pump on. Just track the throttle a little bit. Southwest Airlines flight in 1860, it's a, it's a Boeing 737, he's at 9,100 feet, uh, he's doing 257 miles an hour, he's going into Denver. Did we thank Mr. Ferguson? That's fun. Did we have fun? It was great. Yay! Our first ever flying on an airplane experiments made it. Yay. Congratulations, everybody. Hi, I'm Levi Holberg, 
And like Brandon, I'm a student in the Aerospace Engineering program here at Westy. Our first trip with the NASA IMPACTS project came in December when Brandon and I, along with Mr. Ferguson, Ms. Wilson, Mr. Williams, and the video production crew, caught a flight to sunny California. We landed in Burbank and we were able to spend the day getting to explore Los Angeles. There's a cool part of the trip where we got to drive around and see some major tourist attractions in the area, but we didn't want to spoil it. Here is our video crew from the Video Cinema Arts Program to tell you more. Hi, my name is Angela Scavalleva and I am a third year student in the VCA program. Hi, I'm Giselle Ventura and I'm also in my third year of the program. We were really excited about the trip because it was the first time either of us had flown on a plane. Once we had all our stuff, Mr. Williams and the others surprised us by taking us to Hollywood. We got to walk around and see all the stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. We stopped at the famous TCL Chinese Theater to see the handprints and autographs. And we even saw them getting ready for a Disney movie premiere for the new National Treasure film. We also got to drive around downtown LA. We went to Beverly Hills and even drove up to the Griffith Observatory where we took lots of pictures with the Hollywood sign and the city. We never thought we would ever get to see so many cool things that had to do with our film program on this trip. At the end of the trip, we even got to go to the Santa Monica Pier, right at the end of Route 66. To see all the things happening there, we even got to put our feet in the ocean. It was really cold. So that's it for us. Back to you, Levi. That was such a cool part of the trip, and the water was really cold. Anyway, after we toured LA, we hit the road to drive to Palmdale, California to start our project at the Armstrong Flight Research Center. This is where we would be for the next three days, and we were so excited to get to work. Every day we drove there from our hotel to meet Vidal. After clearing security, we were allowed into a giant hangar where they stored and worked on planes used for the IMPACTS project. No kidding, this place was huge. They had five different planes inside. There were two ER-2s, NASA's DCA Airborne Science Laboratory, and the Queen of the Sky, Sophia. Sophia, or the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, is a Boeing 747 SP aircraft modified to carry a 2.7 meter reflecting telescope. It was there in preparation for retirement, and we were fortunate enough to get a personal tour of this beautiful plane before it flew to its final destination at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona. That was very cool, but not as cool as getting to talk to all the scientists and engineers as they were to get the ERT loaded with all the scientific equipment they need for the upcoming impact flights. Everyone was incredibly nice and they were willing to talk to us and explain what they were doing on the project. Here we are at the Armstrong Flight Research Center. We hope you enjoyed as much as we did. Hi, Lynn. How are you? I'm doing great. Good. So we are here at the Armstrong NASA facility in yeah. Palmdale, California. Um, can you explain what you guys are doing here with the ER-2 plane? So the ER-2 plane is one of our planes for the IMPACTS project. It flies very high and on the uh, uh, plane has uh, remote sensing instrumentation. And we're here because we're putting that instrumentation onto the plane and getting it ready to fly in uh, flights in January. How did an impact start? Well, impact starts as an idea and a discussion between um, several uh, scientists like, wow, we really need to know more about snowstorms and how the snow is distributed inside the storms and why is it distributed in these narrow band structures. We really need to make measurements. So we thought there was an opportunity, uh, what they call a call for proposals. And so my other um, uh, team members and I wrote a very large proposal, gathered other team members, like people who had expertise in particular instruments, put it forward, crossed our fingers, and thankfully we got selected. Do you have any words of wisdom for the future generations who want to go into something in the engineering realm? Oh, this is exciting. So I have lots of words of wisdom. One of them is to be passionate and excited about the world. There's so much to, to learn and so many things that the younger generation can bring. So we always get tell people advice. You got to get your fundamentals like the sciences and the math. But in addition to that, art, music, all the whole and communication, those are all important fields to study and, and uh, learn from. But I think passion and, and enthusiasm 
and determination are the really main uh, things that you need to bring to the field. Things don't always go the way you want, so you've got to be determined to try again. Don't give up. Thank you so much for this conversation, and we hope ER, the ER2 and the P3 have a successful mission. Me too, <laughs> for sure. Can you tell us just a little bit about uh, your role here with the NASA IMPACTS project? I'm the uh, project manager for the ER2 aircraft. And uh, for IMPACTS, we uh, help integrate the instruments and make sure that we're prepared to fly in the areas that we're looking to, uh, that we're approved for the areas that we want to fly into. Any advisement for the, the next generation of STEM kids, of uh, kids pursuing careers in engineering, science? To start is figure out what you're mostly interested in, what inspires you, what motivates you, um, and see how that could possibly develop into a career. It doesn't have to be even through school. It can be external resources, getting involved with clubs and stuff that, that kind of go with that type of uh, interest that you have. Hi, Nikki. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. What is your role at NASA? My primary role is as an operations engineer, and basically what that means is I'm responsible for the airworthiness of the aircraft I've been assigned to. Cool. Um, in my case, that's the DC-8. It's a flying science laboratory, um, kind of like the ER-2, except all the scientists get to fly along with their with their instruments. Talking with you yesterday, you said that you had a crazy journey at, to which led you to NASA. Could you give a brief explanation of how your journey is? Sure. Yeah. So I, uh, when I first graduated from high school, I got. Um, I got low grades in my STEM classes. I was not good at math or physics, and so I said, that's not for me. So when I went to college, I did an English degree. And um, it was great, but really an English degree prepares you to go back to school, right? To either be a teacher or to go to law school. And neither of those paths were something I was interested in. I kind of bounced around at different jobs for, uh, for quite a while before deciding that what I really, really wanted to do was work at NASA. And so I thought, by if I want to work at NASA, how do I get there? The easiest way is to be an engineer. And so I went back to school 10 years after my first bachelor's degree to get a second bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. I finally graduated about three years ago and uh, started out as an intern actually while I was going to school here at the Armstrong Flight Research Center. And I uh, did that for three years. And as soon as I graduated, they hired me full time. And that's how I got here. Hi, Vidal. How are you? Very good. Nice, nice good. to see you. Good. First off, um, what did you graduate with? Um, well, my bachelor's is in organic chemistry. Um, I did organic chemistry back in Mexico. And, uh, and then I did a master's in astrophysics and planetary science. With those degrees, how, how have they helped you get to where you're at today? Yeah, um, science, you know, because all of my degrees are in science. Um, so researching, participating with uh, colleagues, uh, you know, talking about issues that we want to investigate, resolve. Right now I'm a project manager and I'm responsible for you know deploying uh, the ER2 and the P3. But I started uh, being one of the instrument people, for example. I had my own instrument before. I was the instrument operator. I did the data acquisition. I did the data uh, quality control. I make sure that all the data was you know correct. My career kind of like you know kept advancing as I was getting more and more involved in these fields campaigns. I've been fortunate enough to, to work with many different cultures. Um, so all of that, you know, they, all of those little skills kind of like help me, um, you know, plan for a, a campaign, not, not, here, not only here in the US, but internationally as well. Can you explain what we are doing here with the ER2 plane? So we're in the middle of a project integration. So this is when all the instruments that are going to be participating on the field campaign for impacts, you know, they get uh, mounted on the airplane. And once they're mounted, then we go and like test everything and make sure that all the instruments are collecting good information so we can go and, and collect our data, our data set. How many test flights have you guys done in the past? Uh, for this one, we already conducted one and it was just to test the engines and make sure that everything is, you know, working yeah. with, the, with the ER2. And, and again, once the instruments are mounted, then, then we'll go ahead and, and maybe fly another two or three uh, missions just to make sure that all the instruments are collecting really good data. You were talking about how many institutions and universities get their instruments installed on the ER2. How do you guys go with um, having those scientists get their instruments first like, seen and installed? Each instrument serves a purpose. So 
So for example, the ER2 has a lot of uh, laser type of instruments, radar type of instruments. So depending on the scientific objective, in this case, you know, impact is about snow, snow bands, snow formations, clouds and precipitation. So we have a lot of instruments that uh, measure um, you know, clouds uh, measure precipitation and they work and they develop this instrument and then, you know, they, they, they put it in, in, uh, in airplanes like this. We have been doing the weather balloon launch for the last uh, three or four years. Uh, we work with Edge of Space Science, a group that is helping us out with the launch today. We also partner with NASA and we take all of the data that we collect over the next uh, couple of hours and we use that to analyze our projects. It could be anything from a GPS sensor to an altitude sensor to a thermal sensor. There's just a bunch of different projects that each one of the students have created and uh, we're trying to collect that data and then analyze it against um, what the results are for the day today. Okay, you're gonna swing around and make a line up this way. Right where I'm standing. There we go. And now we're gonna line up. All right, make sure your payloads are turned on. We're ready. You ready? Yeah, yeah let's do it. <laughs> kind of stay underneath it as best you can. Don't let the line hit the ground. Just kind of keep it somewhat taut. Don't hold it tight. Good. Have a nice little grasp like you're holding a baby. Good. Like and then just let it go when it gets above. How will I know when I need to like... It'll one? just come right out of your hands. Okay. Hey, load five. Five, four, three, two, one, go. All right, nice job, everybody. That was a wonderful launch. So now what we're going to do is we are going to go retrieve it. If you are coming along for the actual retrieval of it, just make sure that you guys are following those two cars, okay? So I'm gonna follow him. Uh, it is Mr. Jim, he's got the uh, red jacket on right there. So that is gonna be our leader. When we get out in the middle of nowhere, remember service kind of gets a little spotty out there. So there's gonna be a big line of cars going out there. You need to kind of make sure that you're staying really close to the group. Okay, I'm gonna leave you guys here. Okay. And uh, thank you. Yeah. So they're just gonna cut them. So they'll, take there's two. There's two of our guys here. Okay. And they'll coordinate oh, with you as far as going out. Okay, great. Okay. NASA guy, he's going to take all of your guys' collected data and I'm going to send him a couple of projects and then he's going to analyze those. Those will be in it, so they'll get to see, they'll get to meet him. How did, you, how did your guys' project turn out? Pretty good, I guess. I mean, it's fine. Yeah. Nothing happened to it. I mean, it's the, it's something's the shaking same. in there. That's to be expected when you drop something from 60,000 feet. 90,000. 90,000 feet. You guys made it to like 92, I think. I live here in Denver, but I telecommute to uh, San Francisco on a regular basis. And whenever I have meetings or whenever I have to be in the office, then I, I, I travel to San Francisco. The balloon took off from uh, Deer Trail. We have two plots together, right? So one that goes up and one that goes down. And if you notice the balloon goes, the, the balloon starts over here and it ends over there. So the dynamics of this area are completely different from that area, right? 
So you want to separate them from up and down. So then you can start looking at the, you know, the, like what happened when the balloon went up and went down. And the first thing that you can observe, you know, is this big temperature inversion. So you, you launch the balloon from here and immediately the temperature dropped from four degrees to minus four. So that was a big temperature inversion. So, you know, that was your first, that was your first observation, the temperature inversion. Anybody remember that day? How warm was it that day? Mm -hmm. It was very cold. It was really cold, right? Yeah. So it was even colder above us. The temperature inversion was a pretty, as far as a pretty thick one. You know, it lasted from uh, 55 to 7,000 feet. So it was a very hefty uh, temperature inversion. And then as soon as you hit about 7,000 7, feet, you get into a lot of turbulence. So what, what do you think that was? Wind and clouds, maybe clouds. So, you know, it's very important to do, when you're making those measurements, you know, this day it was cloudy, this day it was rain. So you can explain a little bit better. You might be already like hitting the, the cloud base and cloud bases are usually very turbulent, especially in the winter time. And then what happened over here? The balloon, the temperature went up and then it dropped down and then it went up again. You saw the temperature went down and then the balloon went down and then went up. So, you know, the dynamics of the atmosphere are very complicated, right? But inside of the cloud, there's convective processes that, that push the air up and then the air, of course, had to come down on the other side. So maybe your balloon got entangled in one of those convection flows that pushed it up and then suddenly pushed it back down and then slowly went up again. That observations, all these little things, we're observing just from a single plot, just from the uh, temperature versus uh, altitude plot. Could you imagine if we have more instruments? Can you imagine all the things that we can tell about the atmosphere and all the things that we're observing? All that information, we want to use it for our benefit, right? So like for impacts, we're trying to forecast better how much snow is falling, right? But that's why you know campaigns like Impact, you know, they they have a full suite. They have hundreds of instruments inside of the airplane, and they put all this information to try and to explain all this uh, all this phenomenon. Hi, I'm Angel Martinez Roman, and this is Tristan Castillo. We are both third-year students with WHS Video Cinema Arts Program. We were selected to go on the trip to Wallops Island, Virginia, to visit the NASA Wallops Flight Facility and to record the incredible things going on there. We were able to visit the entire complex and we were giving behind the scenes tours of the hangar where they were prepping the P-3 Orion for its mission. The same plane would also carry our friends from the aerospace engineering program with them on an official NASA mission. We also got to see the Mission Operations Control Center where they launch rockets. They also gave us tours of the rocket construction facility, the NASA balloon program office where they build high altitude balloons. We were also able to explore the island and see the world famous Shinkotig ponies on an incredible boat tour. It's a trip we'll never forget for sure. Here are Dakota and Leanna to tell you about what it is like to fly on the P-3 Orion for an actual NASA science mission. It's not fair that we didn't get to go. Next time, pal. Next time. Thanks guys. Don't be too sad. Eight hours on a flight without snacks isn't all funny games. Trust us. Yeah, but I'm not going to lie, it was pretty cool. I'm Leona Rowan, and Dakota and I were super excited about going on the P3 Orion flight. We weren't so excited about waking up at 3 in the morning to do it, but that's the sacrifice you have to make for science. When we got to Wallops facility, we had to watch safety videos so we knew what we had to do when there was an emergency. That's when it started to hit home that what we were doing was real. They even went through the order that we had to go if we made an emergency landing and had to evacuate the plane. It was a little scary, but I was still really excited. When we finally boarded the plane and they took roll call to make sure everyone was there, I was nervous and excited because it was really happening. Robert, yeah. Deanna, and Dakota. We took off while the sun was still coming up and it was beautiful. It took us a couple of hours of flying to get to where the science team was going to start collecting data. And a lot of us took naps. And we flew all the way to Michigan, Wisconsin, and the Great Lakes. Once we got to our destination, the pilots began flying back and forth through the clouds, and that's when things got exciting for the scientists. 
We were able to talk to the impact scientists while they were collecting data in real time, and they explained to us exactly what they were seeing with their experiments. This is when we made the connection that the Arduino experiments that we built collected the same kind of data that we were looking at. When we finally got back to Wallop's flight facility, eight hours later, we were exhausted but excited. We met some incredible people and learned more about weather, microphysics, we'll and the it. environment than we ever thought possible. Everyone in our team was excited to see us back safely, and we were ready for a nap. No kidding, I was so tired. Same, but it's all an experience that I know we'll never forget. Thank, Thank you, NASA. NASA. Um, it is it is very early in the morning. We are already here and it's 4.18 a.m. This is dedication. Let's roll. Fidal, why'd you make us get up this early? It's way too early. Yeah. <laughs> the coffee hasn't kicked in at all. There's the rest of our team coming. Here's home. Welcome everybody, uh, Impact Science Flight. Oh, no. Oh, no. no way. This is where we're going today. We're heading up to Michigan. We'll go up there and we'll do yeah, probably six back and forth. The ER2 to take off, any updates on the uh, So we may or may not be with the ER2 today. Uh, it doesn't change anything for us except it'll make it a little easier to keep our time exactly. Dancing procedures, for those that have been flying, we won't go into detail about it. Just remember you got the placard on board. Just keep your head down, check which side you get out. If we do have to ditch over water, you're just gonna get out into the wrap and uh, there's your emergency suit. And then keep in mind, you'll get on in the emergency suit, then you'll put on your sweet lick, which is your life preserving vest and uh, stand by. So we'll hop out into the wrap and uh, wave at the rescue. Dakota Hall, Westminster High School. How do you feel about this mission that we're going to complete today? Nervous and excited. <laughs> Nervous and excited. Sianna, <laughs> how do you feel about this mission? I'm, I'm excited. As excited as Dakota? Yeah. More excited. Than no. More <laughs> excited. No I love no it. <laughs> I'm going to zoom in on you. Just so you know, if you get one of these, it went on this flight. February 23rd, 2023, we are on NASA's P3 airplane. Here we go. This right here is actually just the visualization for our flight track. So this is uh, basically just waypoints that will fly out to the area that uh, we're gonna be doing our, basically a wall pattern where we fly back and forth to different altitudes. Where in the world is Dakota Hall? <laughs> We're not in 
in Ohio anymore. We're in Ohio. We're in Canada. We're in Canada. Like, Canada. Almost at Detroit. Almost Detroit. Are you guys ready for the bumpy ride now? Yeah. <laughs> is this where it gets bumpy? Bumpy and we go on a roller coaster ride? Yep. Yeah. Free, free Elo Tunes. <laughs> Here we go. Pure white, huh? <laughs> it's just pure white. Oh, there's that. That's all you see. <laughs> So what we're looking at here is radar returns through, through the atmosphere and we're taking whatever the highest reflectivity over the depth is and then I'm putting it onto our web display so that we know what the radar signatures are, where the aircraft is moving. And I fetch this every minute so that as storms are moving, as the whole system is moving, we can change our flight path to accommodate. So she was just saying, hers is very similar to his, but very, very, very seconds. So that was, that was, so this is like longer term kind of thing. I think so, yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. We'll see you. What's the difference between flying a regular plane and like this plane, like in this condition? What do you say? Well, uh, the biggest difference is we we this particular project impacts usually flies in weather that most planes go around. You guys probably weren't on the radios, but the, the ATC would say, "Hey, there's heavy to moderate to heavy precipitation along your route for the next hundred miles. Let me know if you want to deviate." Because that's the standard plan is to go around this kind of stuff. So that I mean that's really the biggest difference. What do you think like the most interesting thing about being a pilot is? You get to see a lot of the world. Uh, and so the you know, the things you look at in Google Maps or the things you look at on a globe or on a Mercator projection, you actually look down and you see it for real. So you, we've flown all over the place. I do pilot training. That's my full-time job. So I'm here to support NASA as an additional co-pilot and learn all these things that John has to say um, because this isn't what I usually do. I'm teaching pilots how to fly. So that's where I spend most of my time. I love flying. It's I would say cloud surfing is the best part of our job. Um, if you're going to be looking down at the earth, just looking down at clouds, it's like cotton balls. It's so beautiful. She's our aircraft expert, our adult yeah. supervision. <laughs> <laughs> Science. How would you advise these fine young ladies yes. to make one of somebody in your seat? Always maintain a, a will to learn. I mean, it's not about the grades or the study, get an A on the next test. That's important, but it's the it's the natural urge to go look that up, whether it's TikTok, YouTube, whatever. I still do that. I still go look stuff up. The guy downstairs will bring something up in the science and I'm like, I don't, I don't know what a dendrite is. What's a dendrite? <laughs> no, I, <don't. laughs> I had a very different route. I had no intention of doing it when I started college. I just wanted to go get my business degree and then go off and do that. But this is where I ended up and it became my passion. Thank you guys for your time. Thanks you for suffering so. through eight hours <laughs> of the line. It was good. It was it's really a long, cool. long, long we, legs out. We were expecting so much worse. Like it I said, so we were like, I, I was like, we're going to die on this airplane. <laughs> if it makes you feel better, my family, every time I tell them I'm doing this, they're like, are you going to make it back? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think we make it back. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys for Thank such you an you know, awesome experience today. So we appreciate it. So what made you want to get high school students kind of connected with this project? You know, I, I wanted to bring this kind of opportunity to you guys because it's something that happened to me as well. You know, when I was in my first year of university, um, I also had the opportunity to do something like this. Not, not at this level because, you know, this is a major campaign. This is, you know, two airplanes. There's a lot of people, a lot of scientists. I wanted to invite you guys to be part of this because I want you guys to fall in love with science as well. And, um, you know, we need more people like you guys to be, you know, in love with science and participate in science. So I'm hoping that this experience gives you like a different view um, of 
how wonderful the science is, how wonderful it is to participate with all these people, talk to the scientists and, and experience what what work for them is and it's you know it's not work it's just like ha they're having fun every day and you you know you get to experience it right um just like you know how you guys um, uh, were flying on the p3 we penetrated clouds we were seeing how the, cl the cloud particles were coming in into our instrument this is a uh, you know a flying laboratory you know we're flying we're taking samples we're not mixing things but uh, we are making real-time observations and that really got me excited and it still gets me really excited i'm really happy to you know participate and I'm really happy that, that you guys were able to participate in that too. Yeah, I definitely feel like that more interactive experience mm -hmm. yeah. is really what gets you wanting to do and learn more about mm -hmm. this kind of field. You know, it was my purpose to bring students to this campaign to make sure that, you know, this experience gets translated to, to you guys. I kind of saw you in the summer earlier in the Boulder trip and I noticed that there were, that, and like also yesterday, there, there's obviously been a couple issues and things that didn't go as planned. So I want to know, like, what kind of is going through your head when things aren't always going as planned? Oh, that's a that's a tough thing. First, you like your mind goes blank, like <laughs> what, what, what happened? And then you have to calm down and think, okay, what are my alternative plans? So you do have to think on your feet. And uh, luckily I'm not alone. It's not like I have to think of everything and I have to make all the decisions right now. I usually look to the rest of my team, uh, especially the mission scientists, the other scientists who are like, what can we do instead? If we can't fly when we want to, but we can fly this other time, what kind of science can we get? Okay, we can get something, good, let's go then. Even though it's not my favorite time, you know, so that could be one problem. We could have a problem with uh, the aircraft. Um, we do have, we designed before we started the project what we call a go-no-go -no -go chart. So there are certain criteria that need to be met, and if they're not met, then we're not gonna go. And that does include particular instruments have to be operating. It's a, it's a hard thing, you know, like to be, faced with you know, something less than ideal, uh, but we still go ahead and, and try to make the best of what we can work with. And you actually get to experience a little bit because you flew, we took off at four in the morning, I remember. Mm -hmm. We took off at four in the morning. I mean, getting up at four in the morning, getting ready to go fly, getting ready to, to, to go and, and uh, collect your measurements um, at a, such an early, an early you know time it's, it takes you know it takes some effort but you know you guys showed up over here and super excited and, and uh, um, willing to do everything it's, it's just you know it's very uh, it's a great commitment to, to science did you have any good conversations when you were flying like you you know there's instruments people were you know collecting their ins their samples they were um, uh, seeing what was coming into the computer. Did you have a good conversation during flight? Yeah, the yeah. whole experience overall was really amazing. Mm -hmm. But I got to talk to a few of the scientists mm -hmm. that were using kind of their instruments to study what we were getting while we were flying. And I got to talk to someone, they were studying basically like the particles in the snow mm -hmm. and like all this other cool stuff. And they talked about also how there was like water in the air and it was below zero and somehow it still like wasn't frozen mm -hmm. and that was really cool also and then um we talked to a few other people and it really reminded me of the kind of projects that we got to do in class with our arduinos very cool i think it's very inspiring as a woman to see other women in this control yeah. uh, environment so what like what words of encouragement do you have for our generation and for women and girls trying to get into the, these STEM occupations? Yes, I'm so happy that you feel it's inspiring. My own career had many moments like, like, do I keep going? This is so hard. And I kept thinking, no, I need to stay here. <laughs> you never know where I can do next and maybe it'll inspire the next generation. It takes a lot of determination and perseverance and being able to deal with things not going your own way. Um, I also found along my pathway, I, I, you just keep talking to other people and identify others you can work with who 
uh, re teach you, treat you with respect. So it wasn't everybody that was like that, but I did find the ones that did. And I, and I said, I'm gonna work with them. And so I don't feel completely alone and lost in this. So find your peers. And what's really inspiring to me is when I look at your generation, there are a lot of women among there. So there's a lot of people who can be supportive. So, um, and, and it can be any gender, any person of any background can be a supportive person and just find them and work with them. And so my advice is, uh, takes perseverance, uh, do the best, you know, do the much background as you can to be strong so that you're a good scientist, you're a great scientist. Uh, don't give up on that part, um, but uh, look for others that you can talk to and lean on to support you in those those tough times. Well, what do you think the, the your friends in, in, in back at home are gonna ask you? for this experience? Um, I think they're definitely gonna like, they're gonna be like, what did you do out there? Why did you go? And I know like they won't really understand like everything I tell them, but I'm gonna definitely tell them like, I got to fly on this really amazing plane and meet lots of amazing people who are doing things that I'm doing, but in a much larger scale. scale. Yeah. And it, it's just really, it's really inspiring to see That's that. That's awesome. That's really, um, that makes me feel really, really well. And I think uh, it's a mission accomplished um, for this, you know, this uh, uh, experience for you guys. So I'm really happy that you guys had a good time. And you know, this is not the end. You're just in high school, so you're just finishing. And I want you to remind you and remind everybody else that there's opportunities. You know, there's this is just one of them. As you advance in your career, as you advance, advance in, you know, the finishing high school, getting to college, there's um, opportunities to participate in these type of campaigns. There's uh, opportunities to do internships with scientists. Did you talk to any of the students that participated in the campaign, like the, one of the uh, PhD students or? Um, we talked to, so before we went on the flight, I think the first day we were here, I talked to someone from the University of North Dakota. North Dakota, yep, yep. Yeah, and she was just telling us about how she's collected all this data and like all the flights she's been on and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was really cool to, to hear yeah. about. So her, for example, she's going to be using that data to write her PhD thesis. And you know her their, her name is going to be in, in scientific publications about the data that she's collecting over here. So you know that's that's how um, scientists kind of like build their own reputation and students. So you know that this experience can you know be on your resume, and and it will help you open the doors to to science and opportunities as well. Do uh, I get to get ask you questions? Uh, yes. Yeah. Do you have any questions so, for me? Yeah, sure. You and 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 also your colleagues. You know. Uh, you're in high school now, and there's, that's a, a time in your life where it's like a thousand directions to go. So does this, has this project helped you think about where you want to be next? Before this project, I wanted to be an aerospace engineer. I've always wanted that. I've yeah. always known that. Yeah. So, but this definitely has for sure put me in the like, this just makes me want to work for NASA even more. I, oh, I love this so much. Great. And, and great. This has really shown me it's been so inspiring and like, yeah. It's just so cool to me. Yeah, and there's a lot of directions to go. There's a lot of different ways to work for NASA. So aerospace is one of them. Yeah. You can design satellites. You can be a scientist. Yeah. You can do anything. This campaign and like being here has really showed me that like it's not really one box. It's like you don't have to fit in this one box to work for NASA. You can be anyone. You can be a pilot. You can be a scientist. You can be literally anyone and you, you can, can make be, balloons yeah you can make balloons <laughs> and you can work yeah. here and it's just so inspiring and right cool right it is hard work to get there and um you know people often get scared of the math and science oh that's so scary <laughs> but don't give up i mean it um what you know when i teach these kind of things or things that require math and science it says it's, it, don't think if it's not easy it doesn't mean you're dumb or something i mean it means this is a tough topic and you'll have to go after it over and over again. You'll have a lot of frustrations, but don't worry, <laughs> you'll get there. <laughs> and you can actually do filming and writing and be a journalist <laughs> and be part of NASA. You can have a background in art and you can be part of NASA. Uh, those backgrounds, which we think of as, uh, you know, liberal arts, those are strong and necessary background too. And lots of ways that you can use that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you either behind the wheel, behind the uh, whatever they call it. It's not a wheel. It's like all these different things that operate the aircraft. Maybe you'll be a pilot. You never know. So excellent.
I'm thrilled. To see, I'm thrilled that you guys all came, and um, hope that we're inspiring more than just you guys, but everybody. Thank you for this opportunity, and just thank you. Okay, great. Thank you too. <laughs> <laughs> While I've been here, I've noticed a lot. Also, is like the people who work here. It definitely wasn't like a linear path to mm -hmm. NASA. They right. started somewhere totally different, and they ended up here. But they really love it here. Yeah. And I think that's just really amazing. Mm -hmm. It's true, you know, I mean, I, I come from Mexico and I, you know, I, I remember seeing the first launches to the, to the space station, to the moon. Uh, I remember seeing them on TV and as a little kid and thinking like, well, I wish I could, one day I'm going to work for NASA and, you know, I'm here. So it's kind of like a dream come true and, and I'm so excited and, and I'm, I, I, again, I, I'm trying to bring that excitement to, to you guys. You guys are the next generation. So. I hope you can take us to the moon, to Mars, and, 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 and beyond. Thank you. Yeah. This experience has been very, just really inspiring. I mean, our pilot the other day, I thought that was really cool that she was like a woman. I know. Yes, I'm, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, I just think your story is really cool as well. So that just, like, anybody can do what they want as long as you can work for it. Right, right. If you want to give any advice to the students nowadays, it's just just do what makes you happy. and. And if it makes you happy, you know, the happiness radiates around you and uh, success will come your way.